Good ladies and gentlemen, good evening and welcome to Citizen A, where we wrap the week's current affairs with the best political team on television from a very Auckland perspective. Warning, we're as fair and balanced as Fox News. Joining me tonight, I'm a revolving panel of bloggers and Auckland opinion shapers. She's a lecturer at the Department of Film, Television and Media Studies at the University of Auckland and her hair is the only naturally growing antidote to Michael Laws. Digital feminist and blogger Phoebe Fletcher and he runs the best independent news site in New Zealand. He makes Edward R. Murrow look like Paul Henry, editor of scoop.co.nz, the ever brilliant Selwyn Manning. Welcome to you both. Coming up tonight, issue one. Why are we building high-rise prisons in Auckland and why do police need more powers when the crime rate is dropping? Issue 2. Darren Hughes has resigned and former Auckland Central MP Judith Tizard has stepped aside on the party list. Have the New Zealand Labour Party finished self-mutilating themselves? Issue 3 tonight. Last week was the Auckland Central Front Runners debate between Nikki Kay and Jacinda Ardern. Who did our panel think impressed? And we'll end the show on a final word. Let's kick things off with Issue 1. The new Auckland private prison was launched in the media last week with all the fanfare of a new rugby franchise. Uncritical journalist after uncritical journalist breathlessly sold the joys of this new age of multi-storied hyper-prison as if it was going to become an Auckland tourist attraction. Phoebe, New Zealand's murder rate has halved in the past 20 years. Despite the misperception that crime is out of control, why are we building more prisons if the crime rate is falling? Oh, I think that uh, the National Party and, to a certain extent, Māori, including Tainui, for example, are looking at this as a business opportunity to privatise prison. Right. I mean, the same thing has happened in the United States, where they've had relatively the same crime rate since, I think, around 1970. Mm -hmm. um, yet their incarceration rate has just uh, gone astronomically. Uh, New Zealand, I believe, in the Western world is one of the second highest rates of incarceration. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. That's right. Um, Selwyn, the counter from the right is that the crime rate is falling because we are locking more people up. Does that justify, as, as Phoebe was pointing out, the second highest incarceration rates in the developed world? Because Kim Workman, Director of Rethinking Crime and Punishment on Scoop this week, was hugely critical of that argument. Yeah, exactly. And the other disturbing thing is is that the crime rate, re you re those representing our, our awful crime rate, incarceration rate, should I say, mm. are highly um, stacked in the area of Māori. Right. You know, so it, it's not just New Zealanders having to kind of be banged up for, m in many cases, it appears menial crimes. Yeah. Um, it is really, really weighted against Māori in this area. I think it's a, it's a state of being in this country where politically the population has been swindled into a situation where it demands of its politicians yeah. more severe sentencing. We've got lobbyists like we know yep. that have been out there gunning for this type of thing and they centre around to exploit the victims of those of very serious and, and awful crimes. Yeah, sure. We see it time and time again, Bomber. I think, it, once again, it comes down to sensitising the public in a, in a sense and then the, the politicians can then campaign and strategize around exploiting that. So it's just about getting used to just throwing people in prisons all the time? You know, the, the trends are the public expects severe punishment for severe crimes. Mm. But what we are seeing is, and with the advent of, you know, the influence of the ACT Party on, right. on politics yep. here, we, we see this slide into you know, this want of three strikes for the most basic crimes yeah. and you're banged up. For the rest of your life. Um, the no parole. And, and what does that do? It, it, it institutionalises individuals that basically need a steer in the right direction. Mm, mm. Um, it, it, it creates a problem. Apparently dehumanising human beings only leads to worse, uh, <laughs> worse outcomes. Phoebe, it's easy for the media, who are myopic about ratings-driven crime stories, to whip up anger, which gets easily manipulated by political forces. Simon Power, right, is an example. Before he came to office, was forever trying to tell the New Zealand public that prisons were adult Disneylands with underfloor heating, plasma televisions, and landscaping to rival the great gardens of Europe. How much blame should the politicians receive for this? I think quite a lot, actually. And I mean, the problem with this contract with Serco is that it has been done an undemocratically. The, we've had the Greens criticising them for not showing the contract to Parliament. Mm. Uh, we've got very vague information on the prisoner-to-guard ratios. Mm. For some reason, they are not releasing that yet. We've had the argument that it's going to save New Zealanders a lot of money um, because it, they can do it at a rate of 10% less than it would cost us usually. Although I note that they get 10% of their contract back for performance. 
um, you know, oh, bonuses. Oh, really? So, you know, really the argument is, is that in many cases, in New South Wales, for example, you know, prison privatisation hasn't saved people money. I think the politicians need to take a little blame here. Mm. Um, in terms of the New Zealand media, I mean, this is really a, um, partially to do with the kind of dramatisation of news and that crime is very cheap. You can mm. just monitor the police radio, send someone out there. It's immediacy. You don't need to send a journalist out yep. um, to spend a lot of time researching a story. But, you know, we've also fired most of our journalists in New Zealand. Yeah, we've had right. NZPA go under this yeah, week. Yeah. Um, so this is a, a kind of direct result of the com culmination of these two things. Don't you think, think it's ex extraordinary that Circo has picked up the contract of New Zealand and yet overseas they have been found guilty of beatings, they've been found guilty of, of, of corruption within their own, um, the, with their own their prisons, and their prisons rank as the worst in, in, in the UK. Isn't it amazing that the media haven't picked up on any of that? Yeah, highest rate for self-harm in a circo prison in Scotland. Yeah. Um, I, I think that there's just not enough um, interrogative journalism being done on this. I mean, obviously there's a problem with incentivising um, prisoners. Mm. Yeah, know? that's right. It's not something that the state should be taking care of because um, if it's privatised, there's just not the same realms of accountability. And, you know, they're sort of saying we're going to have an observer in there and that all the prisoners will still remain under the CEO. Let's, you know, not get this wrong. This is a target scheme. Mm. We're going to see prisons privatised and, you know, much more away from the state from now on. Absolutely. This, this to me too, Bomber, it, it let's boil, you know, boil it down to the basics here. Mm. You know, it is privatising and it's profiteering over what is a society problem. Yeah. You know, if we work on society's problems collectively, it has to be government-led, in my view, yeah. to actually exploit this t situation for the means of creating a profit for a private company and an overseas company at that yeah. is just, you know, this is getting into swindle territory on the actual taxpayer. Really. Uh, there, there, are, there were just over 100 offences per every thousand people in the 2006 to 2007 year, compared with almost 130 per thousand in the 1996 to 1997 year. It is the fear of crime that drives the middle class appetite for throwing more and more New Zealanders into prison. If private prisons start manipulating that process even further by funding victims' rights groups that call for longer and harder sentences, what do you think are the possible outcomes in New Zealand? Uh, I, I think we can see what the outcomes are by looking at the trends that have been established in the last number of years. Mm. What we have seen clearly is statistics going down, and yes, the government is applauding itself in producing a regime where it's hard and it's going to actually lock people up, and it argues that that's going to be a disincentive for people to commit serious crimes. We know, and the police have always said, that the most serious crimes are actually committed by a small proportion of New Zealanders, mm. that in that pocket, Many of these types of policies are actually having no effect whatsoever. The, po the police know, however, that if you put in proactive policing policies mm. that we saw advanced around 2000 through to 2003 in this country, mm. um, that that has a long and medium term effect on bettering the system in right. the sense that you're starting to actually prevent people from entering into a life of crime. Now, surely... At the, that is an area that needs to be in balance. We're not a arguing, I'm not arguing, that there should not be an immediate response that, um, you know, by police and, and it should not, there should be a strong consequence to serious crime. Of course, of course. No one's going to But what I'm saying is here that at the expense of proactive policing, when the money all goes into that front end type of thing, then we're actually doing ourselves a disservice now and in the future. A question to both of you. With the Sensible Sentencing Trust humiliated by its backing of political hypocrite David Garrett, yeah, I always throw up in the back of my throat when I say that. <laughs> uh, where will the raw me medieval law and order vote go to? Who's, who's going to pick it up this year? Oh, I think possibly national because of Judith Collins. Yeah. 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 Is she going to be the cheerleader for the lunch uh, uh, She certainly got the hold on that whole policy, but remember to uh, watch the re-entry into the campaign of Winston Peters and oh, campaigning on, yeah. on strong, uh, nationalistic yeah. and consequential type policies. And I'd suggest that Public this floggings. He'll be bringing back public floggings, won't he? Especially if you come yep. from overseas. That's right. He'll <laughs> so be doing public floggings. Yeah. Um, both of you, if the crime rate is dropping, why do the police need massive new search and surveillance powers? And why do the SIS have these heard in secret? What, what, if, if the crime rate's dropping, why do they need all these new powers? Ah, that's a very good question. They don't. 
I mean, mm. what we have seen in many countries at the moment is the absolute erosion of civil liberties. And, you know, nowhere more so perhaps than in the United States, uh, where you had Obama campaign on the fact that he would rebel the, repeal the Patriot Act. Yep. He's not. He's actually stepped it up. Yeah, um, yeah. You know, I, I really think it's abhorrent that we're getting these sorts of policies in New Zealand. I think it is partially pressure from the United States and countries like that. And, you know, what it is is, it, is essentially the absolute erosion of civil rights. Why, why, do, why do every government department need to have the right to bug my house and warrant my, uh, without a warrant? Why, why do they? Why does the government depart? Why does the pork board need to bug my house for three days without a May, warrant? Maybe they think that it's contrary to the national interest if you eat too much uh, pork chop or something. Well, you know, well, maybe who, if, who, if I go vegetarian, yeah. maybe they're going to start. Yeah. They're going to bug me if yeah, I go vegetarian. You're not, you're not putting enough yeah, back into yeah, the copper. That's right. Now, I, I, I think in, in support of what Phoebe is saying, there's a global trend here. But the interesting thing about this SIS amendment bill, in my view, is, mm. is that it's starting to create a picture of what we know they're doing that perhaps the SIS has been operating perhaps outside the current legislation framework. What? In the, in the sense that if this is what the Prime Minister, if it's all about what the Prime Minister John Key says in equipping the SIS to do their job in a 21st century kind of yes. way, and, and being able to allow them to be able to use new el electronic kind of devices yep. to do their job and to infiltrate onto mobile phones. Well, we know that the mechanism for both of the main leaders in mobile phone areas have had a, a pipe in there so that police intelligence, police uh, security, SIS can at will basically have a listen anyway. Yep. Now, the question would be, and we would never find the answer to this, we'd never be able to get to it, because of the secrecy around it, but have they been operating illegally in such ways already? Is that what's behind the current legislative yeah. I mean, we have to ask ourselves too that um, this is at the same time that the Uruwera trial is going through That's without right. a jury. Without a jury. Um, you without know, without Simon a jury. Power, I believe it was, said that um, this is, you know, the biggest justice case that yeah. we've had in 50 yeah. years, yeah. and we're seeing this go through without a jury. I mean, this is a, certainly a, an approach we know to in a Australia violation of civil that liberties that we're seeing by this government. We know in Australia that they, they put through laws under John Howard that if a person, just like the Patriots Act, if a person was taken by ACO, ACO you know, the, their equivalent, mm -hmm. the SIS, and under a particular new law that came out under John Howard, and was they were banged up for a couple of weeks, they were not just um, prevented from telling media or, or their employers what had happened to them. It was against the law for them to even tell their families Family, that's what right. happened to them. Uh, now, the excesses of this uh, kind of trend are really disturbing. The big disturbing factor in this whole thing is the Prime Minister insisting that this legislation that they're drafting at the moment yeah. be, be held in private. Yeah, they, yeah, no yeah, one if knows if the if, on. if only we had a public broadcaster that could, you know, point these things out to people. Uh, who wins and who loses from more multi storied private prisons in Auckland. Is Auckland gonna, is it gonna become a great tourism attraction? That's what the journalists were kind of suggesting. Oh, I don't think it's gonna become a great uh, tourism attraction. I mean, really, Auckland Central Remand Prison, that, you know, it was built in 1888. Mm. It, it is a really horrible place. Mm. I don't know if you've, have you ever uh, been yeah, inside there? Times. Yeah, it's a very, very cold, dark, you know, dingy place. So I do believe there was a need for a new prison in that particular instance. Yep. Um, but I do prison? think that we, we all lose from privatising yep. prisons. You know, obviously we can't have incentives mm. for keeping people locked up. Who wins, who loses? Who wins? The person who has been sitting there with a bucket to go to the toilet in overnight in the old castle. Yep. Um, they win, they win yep. by being some, into some sort of humane facility. The, the, the losers in all of this are those who are susceptible to the arguments coming from some of the mainstream media that mm. they are going to be set up in some sort of fantastic kind of new palace yes. uh, that, that, that they do not deserve such yep. things. Now the reminder is, is that they're locked up in a thing that has got m less finesse than a concrete car park in yep. downtown Auckland. Yeah, 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 they lose their liberty. We always forget that. People need to be punished. They're being punished. They've lost their liberty. Uh, issue two, the government announced a zero budget. Their incompetence in Christchurch is now terribly apparent. They are slashing public services left, right and centre and are intending to privatise everything not nailed down while crippling the welfare state. Where is the political opposition? Phoebe, how much should Phil Goff kiss Judith Tizard this week? Oh, I mean, it's a really difficult question. The whole handling of this affair is just... Let's uh, start with Judith. Let's start with Judith. <laughs> Judith, um, well, I think, you know, there is an argument that Deborah Coddington made, and I think that she's absolutely correct, is that Darren Hughes shouldn't have been gotten rid of as quickly as he did. You know, that 
Phil Goff should have gone public on it straight away rather than waiting two weeks. Mm. Um, you know, he should have given him an opportunity to disprove that charge and that might have actually given him an opportunity to perhaps, you know, keep his job if he was proven innocent. Um, in terms of Tizard, uh, I think it's a tough one, you know, that, um, I mean, really we've seen um, the bloggers, for example, you know, we'll leading this. That. We'll yeah. get into that. Um, just on that though, you, so you think you think Darren should have stayed on longer? Uh, you, you, you don't think that, that, that having an 18 year old at your house, the deputy leader's house, you share with the deputy leader's house at 2 a.m. in the morning isn't a serious enough lapse of judgment to have stepped down? Uh, oh. Whether the allegations proven, hey look, we don't know, no one was there, right? Everyone's innocent before, before, you know, before proven guilty. But the actual, the fact that it occurred, surely is a lapse of judgment. I, th I think it is a lapse, lapse of judgment on his part. Um, part, but yep. he is quite a young MP, yep. and I think that he can't you know continue holding on to the education portfolio. No. Could he? Could he? <laughs> well, I, th I think you know there there is an issue here of he should have had you know the opportunity, you know, not to be slandered or yep. for yeah, this yeah, to be yeah, played yeah, out yeah, in a yeah, much yeah, more yep. fair manner. But and Judith, I do Judith has done a lot more than everyone thought she did. We got, got to give her some love now, don't we? I, I think we do, and I think she did get a bit bullied by the Labour Party this week. So on TV3's Rightly Patrick so. Gower, Patrick Gower blamed Phil Goff for being spooked into dumping Judith by whale oil and Kiwi blog. Seeing as Gower you was using them as sources of himself, isn't he like a cancer patient blaming cigarettes while lighting another smoke? How much power does Cam really have? Cam has got, yeah. Cam's got a really good sense of blood. Yes. And he knows where to actually point that whale when he wants to go for the jugular. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, you've got to give him credit for that. Uh, as far as influence is concerned... Is I it because they're too lazy or is it because uh, they're underfunded? Which one? It's a mix of, it's a mix of two. It's a mix yeah. of two. But le let's look at it. The facts of the matter are that, that no one wanted Judith Tizard back in the house. Mm. If we're looking at that particular issue, let's mm. look at that. Yeah. Goff had no ability whatsoever to persuade her either way yep uh, nor did the leader of the labor party uh, sorry yep. the uh the the um the president of the labor yep. party really what it came down to was the the women's faction and arguably the rainbow faction inside mm -hmm. labor saying it's time to keep your nose away that it's going to alter the balance arguably at the next election if our party list goes down it's other women and other rainbows that are going to yeah. miss out and having mm. a shot at being yeah. in parliament stay away and give us a break and i think that's what to so both of you how badly did phil goff handle the darren hughes allegation well g give him out of 10 out of 10 what are you going to give him ah oh, oh, i think about I found a three, you know, saying that <laughs> that's it, generous. That's wow, that's <laughs> gen that's so generous. <laughs> saying that it strengthened his leadership, and <laughs> you know, like some of the comments he has been coming out with lately. I mean, you know, well, the whole has, way that no one else wants the leadership. His position strengthened. No one wants to touch it now. He's there. He's safe. So technically, he's right. Technically, he's right. Um, uh, you know, you've really got to question the people skills going on here. That you've got Judith Tizard making statements like. Uh, Phil Goff sounded like he was swallowing rats when he, <laughs> he asked me back. I mean, they really need to get a, a hold on their interpersonal relationships with each other. Uh, and come out, out of 10, out of 10. What are you, you going to give him? Phil? Yep. Mm. Two to three. Oh, see, that's pretty you know, generous. Somebody that yeah. can sneak through, you know, the, the, when, the, when the knives are out. Yep and the teeth are ready to bite into your yeah, throat yeah. from he, those he factions those right. factions inside Labour. Nothing more vicious than the Labour you've got to give him credit no, for something. To. You have you know, to. And yep. I stand on the premise yep. that Phil Goff is still the best that they've got. Absolutely. You Absolutely. Know, he he may true. not be that's the true. best leader in oppositional politics, but yep. he's certainly the best cabinet minister Easily. that they've got Easily. in the ranks. That's so true. And that's arguably so true. a better so prime minister than the one we've got should they ever be given the shot. Yeah, yeah, agree. But the fact of the matter is, is the difficulty for Phil Goff is that he is representing a minority faction. He has the support of leader. Yep. But we know from the count yep. that went on that weekend yep. that the other factions that would normally oppose Phil Goff yep. dominate the caucus. And yep. you can see that in the change of policies that Goff is putting out that's there. Right, that's right. He deserves a good three yep. from being able to actually stand up and yeah, say, no, yeah, you know, this five, is what actually, we stand If you have a survive against Labour Party factions, give him, give him, give him a ten. Uh, to both of you, uh, should Phil Goff have told Andrew Little about the Darren Hughes allegation? Of course. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Did your it, mouth open when you it, heard that? It's the first thing that you should do, without sounding like a high and mighty, you know, 
uh, uh, hindsight type candy. No, no, here. no, no, no. That, that's the first thing you'd do. You'd sit Andy, down. You've got, got Dar problem. Darren Andy, in the room yep. with you, and yep. you say, "This is serious, mate." Yep. I agree with Matt McCartan. Yep. You say, "You're toast, mate." Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. right. We're, that's right. we're on to little. Yeah. Now, what are we going to do that's about right. it? That's right. How are we going to? My we... suggestion is this, you and step down it now. obviously didn't. I think they were reeling through. One of the talents of Phil Goff is he is a very loyal. Uh, he politician is, he, bless him, bless and, him, and his is. loyalty overran. I agree. I his agree. His and, 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 and again, just you know, on, on that side, I think and I, I, I I know Darren, you know, and it is it is painful watching this happen. Yep. And I have a lot of Araha, a lot of uh, we uh, all know we Mana. need as many good politicians that, that, as we right, can get in right. this country. And, 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 and um, but ones of solid yeah, judgment right. in the private exactly, area yeah. as well. Uh, what does Labour have to do before the election? What are they going to do? Well, I think they've actually got to, you know, stop being so much on the defensive and actually come out with I some know. kind of strong policies. Figure out where to attack on. They yes. seem to <laughs> seem to be, you know, seems to be attack points here, and then Phil mm. Goff will go wide over here. They're as good, they're as, good um, as the Libyan rebels. They really are at the moment, aren't they? The, yeah, very good at all. the sad thing with Labour was that over Christchurch, it was starting to actually pick up some momentum, oh, and no, the s suspicions no. were that local polling in that area was swinging toward yeah, Labour. Yeah. That's the sad thing. Who wins or loses from Labour's mini meltdown? Oh. Well, I think National wins. Oh, you really? Labour Labour loses. Yes, well, because really it makes think them that? think um, makes them look like a weak opposition. Okay. You know? well, you Although I think that this quite often happens. Yeah. You know, when parties are in opposition. I mean, National were seen as weak. You know, for many of the ni uh, nine years that Labour was in power. You know. It's because yeah. they were under Dawn Things change. Um, and Bill English. Mm. Well, uh, who, who wins or loses? Uh, the women's factions, the rainbow factions, and the union factions win because yep. they know they dominate caucus yep. now. They have mm. the power yep. and they can dominate the actual policies that roll out in campaign time. I think that John Key loses for the following reason, right? I mean, do you ever go, what? How does, how does John Key lose? Because because the, the, the people who are going to be annoyed with the Labour, they're voting New Zealand first. He just got over 5%. Yeah, well, he just I, got over 5%. There is a suddenly, sector of that. Suddenly, yep. John Key has less uh, yep. coalition partners. That's exactly the, the point here, Hesitant. Bomber. You're Hesitant. right on the button. Hmm. National is fast losing coalition they support. They don't have any coalition the partners. Act, the ACT Party could is easily gone. implode. Yep. And the Multi Party is left with uh, a core of that's right. conservatives that even Naitahu yep, don't right. support. Oh, uh, well, as we had Nikki Kay on the debate the other night saying that we've done a agreements with people that we don't need at all, like those models. They will get into <laughs> you know, the Thank big you. election is 2014. Right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. You know. Thank you, panel. Coming up, what did our panellists think about last week's debate between Auckland Central frontrunners Nikki Kay and Jacinda Ardern? Citizen A is back after the break. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. This is Citizen A. We're reviewing the week with bloggers Phoebe Fletcher and Selwyn Manning. Issue three tonight. Last week was the first of three debates between the Auckland Central frontrunners Nikki Kay and Jacinda Ardern. What did our panel think about their performance? Phoebe, both were staunch on the environment. What did they need to do to reach out to the Auckland Central Green voting bloc? I think both of them had a really good idea of what the Auckland Green Central voting bloc wants, to be honest. Um, you know, we had discussions about the bridge and mm. where the bridge is currently going to land, which is in the middle of the marina. Yes. So we had Nikki Kay actually going quite against the National Party's stance. Um, we had, you know, the discussions about Waiheke ru rubbish collection and also that bringing back the Mardi Gras. So I think both of them have a really good understanding of what Auckland needs. Yeah. The problem is that uh, Nikki Kay is with a party that almost entirely disagrees with her on pretty much every <laughs> that point. Is that, problem, that, that is the problem, isn't it? That is the problem. Selwyn, were you surprised by Nikki's certainty that National could govern alone? Um, yeah, I mean, it's an impressive confidence, isn't it? Oh. You know, that they, uh, th there are consequences, um, you know, obviously for National if it attempted to do that. If it was really intent on burning off ACT, it would put in a strong candidate, yep. as the Slater camp would want, in, yes. in, into Epsom. Um, and Auckland perhaps would be better for that. Yes. Uh, but, you know, it was an interesting thing. I think in the sense, though, that both... You know, Auckland Central has got two very, very, very dedicated and impressive candidates in this election. Yeah, for the first time, uh, yep. You know, and apologies to the other parties that will be putting up candidates, but in respect to Labour and National, very impressive. I did think that Jacinda Ardern was slightly punch drunk from the, you know, the internal fighting that had gone on in Labour the previous week. 
Yeah. Um, you could see that there was an awful lot, um, you know, going through ahead. Uh, Nikki Kay, if you peel away the parties from these two individuals, Nikki Kay really, really did the business. Yep. Mm. She was agile, intellectually astute, yep. and was able to present a picture um, of, of, a, of a constituency MP, yep. irrespective of party, who yep. was dedicated to representing mm. the electorate. The problem for her, though, was going to be that, uh, you know, the rest of her caucus just are almost diametrically opposed to everything that she should, you know, that and she uh, stands for as a liberal within the national. And, and in, a, in a response to that, Bomber, I always try to reflect back on recent history. Yeah. Nikki Kay seemed to me to be very similar to National's once MP and Cabinet Minister Catherine Rich. Yes, you yeah, know, yeah, yeah, either yeah. of yeah. those two dominating yeah. parties could yeah. have Nikki Kay in That's their right. caucus. Mm. That's right. um, either of those two parties could have had Catherine Rich, and yeah. both of those MPs, I would suggest, have acute sense of of knowing, like what Phoebe was saying just before, of what their electorate and what New Zealand's yeah. fairness is, really. Phoebe, how does Jacinda compete with her party's past procrastination on infrastructure in Auckland? I mean, that's a difficulty. She's, she, the, the Labour have got a lot of baggage on this issue, haven't they? I, I think it's hard. You know, I think the only way that they can really do that is to look to the future, and it mm. really does involve these issues of public transport and National's absolute reticence to do anything for yeah. citizens of Auckland City. Yeah, mm. yeah. Selwyn, did it sound like Stephen Joyce just talking about that might fund the central rail loop from, from, from Nikki, or did it sound like Stephen Joyce wanted to Auckland as the think he was? Oh, a bit of both. A bit of what, both. What we saw too in a previous program of Citizen A is you had Penny Hulse, the Deputy Mayor of Auckland, yep. actually indicating that. Uh, there had been quite quiet talks between Treasury and Auckland City that's Council. Right, that's right. Treasury had come up to Auckland, yes. which must be the first time in history <laughs> that you <laughs> jimmy barred those guys out the, of the, their the office. The Lord of the Nazgiel doesn't, doesn't, uh, doesn't, doesn't absolutely. visit the Shire, does so it? So what Nikki Kay was saying to me was in keeping with that. Yeah. That there was an air that was being put to Auckland here. Yeah. That there is a realisation within National that, that Auckland, Auckland is, has mobilised into yeah. a political force. She seems to be aware of it. It's her job to make sure the likes of Stephen Joyce, John Key, the type five at the top of yeah. National actually come through and honour that. If they don't, then Nikki Kay could be toast if they actually yeah. botch it up between now and the election. Mm. Yeah, that she could. Uh, to both of you, do you think Phil listens to Jacinda and do you think John listens to Nikki? Hmm, that's a tough one. I think probably Phil listens to Jacinda yep. a bit more than John listens to Nikki. John doesn't listen to Nikki, <laughs> does he? John does not. John doesn't listen to well, anyone. John doesn't listen to Peter Sharples. No, I, th I think in you know some senses she is an asset to the National oh, Party. Absolutely. And the reason why is because you know the same thing as the coalition with the Maori Party is that she allows them to look more liberal. Yeah. And I, I would say, why doesn't the National Party actually uh, pull into its fold more of the Nikki T K yeah. types yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. and yeah. actually create a party? that can carry co the country forward instead of these ideologues that actually want to destroy... Who run. won, who lost? Oh, I, I would have to agree with Sal on that. If you stripped away the parties, it would yep. be Nikki Kay that actually came across stronger. I think. Who won, who lost? Yeah, Nikki Kay came out, but once again, I think Jacinda Ardern had a week of hell. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah and she does she, listen, yeah. Phil yeah. Goff does listen to, she used to work in his office. Yeah, they right, know each other. Right, she, she's that's a brilliant right. MP, and I don't want to pull it down. The next, the next front runners debate will be in June. The topic, who is best for Auckland, National or Labour or neither? Let's wrap the show with last word. Phoebe, your last word this week is... Uh, my last word has to be on the fisheries. I think we have a major issue here, the fact that we have New Zealand companies that are basically employing floating sweatshops off our shore. Yeah. Okay, there is... Observers don't want to go onto those boats. They go onto New Zealand boats because of the working conditions. We are seeing foreign workers dying at sea. We are getting New Zealand companies directly employing them. Um, we've got agents taking away most of their wages. In some cases, they're not actually getting paid. I think that Phil Heatley from National actually needs to move on this. Yes. He has flip-flopped on it. He has blamed it on Labour. This stuff has been going on for a long time in the fisheries industry, which is worth around $1.4 billion to New Zealand. And we're actually seeing the profits in the fisheries industry dropping. Even though companies like Tally's, you know, pay New Zealand win wages and can still turn a profit. Mm. So I think there needs to be some serious movement on this. Amen, sister. Amen. Uh, your final word? Final word is um, uh, quickly on the NZPA 
um, imminent closures. Yes, there. you know yes, what, a, what an awful situation where you've got two multinational media mm. giants who are in a turf war in this country, yep. particularly in Auckland yep. over the uh, the weekend papers, but right, right across the board, and they have pulled down NZPA since 1880. Oh, that sad, thing has been an institution. Sad. Forty-two journalists Jesus. losing their livelihood with nowhere to go awful. in an election year. Awful. So on every ground, it's an abhorrence. Yep. The other thing yep. is bomber. Yep. The SIS bill. Oh, now, disgusting, disgusting. Uh, that's, a, that's an absolute abomination yes. on our thing. In the sense, in this sense, we do not know what the government has planned. It's saying, trust us. We yeah. know what we're doing on that. Well, that's not how a democracy works. <laughs> yeah, we know, don't that trust is not you. how legislation is actually yeah. uh, formed here. What I would encourage, if we can, and if, if, if they listen, yep. the Green Party leader, right? Yep. Russell Norman yes. is on that committee. Yes. Uh, he has problems with that legislation. He as does. much as he is able to legally, I would say, get out there and yep. voice your concerns. Do it, Russell. Do, Do the it. country a service. Do it, Russell. Thank you, Phoebe. Thank you, Selwyn. Ladies and gentlemen, to my final word, and it's about the killing off of TVNZ7. Nice to haves is the National Party euphemism for pinko shit the free market should pay for. I don't understand why the most vulnerable in society had to do with less because of a global economic meltdown none of them had any hand in making. How can their welfare be reduced to nice to have? I'll tell you what's nice to have. 1.7 billion to Mr. McDo at South Canterbury Finance was nice to have. The 30 million dollars to the private education industry was nice to have. The 15 million dollars to Warners for their manufacture crisis of The Hobbit was nice to have. Those 34 luxury BMWs are real bloody nice to have. A democracy is only as good as the media debate allows for. Without public broadcasting, our quality of information declines. The function of the media is to hold the powerful to account. If TVNZ7 is debased to simple corporate profits and ratings-driven entertainment, we are diminished as a culture. Fascinating that Stephen Joyce could find $43 million for media works at a rate Ironbridge could not have found on the open market for a company he once owned, yet no money for TVNZ7. Public broadcasting isn't a nice to have, it's a necessity for our democracy, which is why this show is proud to be supported by New Zealand On Air, and I'll be prouder if they give us some more funding this year. If you like tonight's show, please join our Citizen A Facebook site and contact with other like-minded new citizens, and follow me on my Citizen Bomber Twitter and Citizen Bomber Facebook page. Thanks for watching Whanau, good night Aotearoa. Supporting local content so you can see more of New Zealand.